historian explaining, a historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and other platforms. And the link to my Patreon page should be in the description. If you're a patron, you get access to all of my materials, including some patron only. So I've been away for a while, partly because I have been researching Shakespeare, particularly his life and times, apart from his famous writings. And I want now to start my examination and discussion of Shakespeare the man and the myth. And normally I produce a a myth of the month, which, you know, in good months might come out every month, and they'll be on some particular historical myth. Well, when it comes to Shakespeare, there is so much to unpack and dissect that I think I'm going to make it in three installments. This will be the first of the three, one about Shakespeare in the documentary historical record, one about the sonnets and what we can learn from them, and one on the so-called authorship controversy. And I think the third one will be the one that will be patron only. So if you become a patron by then, you can hear my discussion of the authorship dispute, right? The so-called debate, if you want to call it that, over whether Shakespeare's works were not really written by William Shakespeare, but by someone else. But I'm going to put that aside for now and simply discuss what we can and cannot say about Shakespeare as a real person and how it relates to the iconic image of Shakespeare that we have, right? The most famous author there has ever been, the great light of English literature and the stage, the man of genius and passion and imagination, And what do we actually know about him outside of what we might choose to guess or infer or imagine from the plays and poems that he wrote? So to start that discussion, I'm going to begin at the end, which really is the place where the man and the myth meet. On New Year's Day, which was March 25th, 1616, a middle-aged English actor and theater manager and businessman, was lying on his deathbed in his home called New Place, near Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire, England. We don't know what was the matter with William Shakespeare, but it was clear that he was very ill already by this point, maybe with a fever like typhus, maybe with a brain hemorrhage or injury, but he clearly expected that the end was coming, and so he took the time to compose his last will and testament. This will is the only manuscript document that survives that was composed by William Shakespeare himself. And I say composed, not wrote, because most likely it was written out by a lawyer or some other associate, not by William Shakespeare's own hand. And I think the fact that this is the only manuscript from Shakespeare's creation that we have surviving, the fact that it is his will, forms a wonderful pun that I like to think William Shakespeare himself would have liked. One of the reasons why we suppose he was already gravely ill by this time is that three separate pages of the will are signed with Shakespeare's own signature. And they're in a very shaky, even broken hand, as if his hand was already very unsteady. These are three of the only six surviving signatures on documents relating to Shakespeare, and those compose the only actual manuscripts from his own hand that anyone has ever found. Although this is a very personal document about his preparation for the end of his life and the disposition of his possessions, there are no poetic or pithy last words, no statements of sentiment. It's a very cut and dry, practical document. The vast bulk of his money and property around Stratford, which by this time was considerable, was willed to his eldest daughter, Susanna. And the fine country house in which he had been living for some years, called New Place, 
was entailed, meaning that the entire estate as a single unit was to go to Susanna and her male heirs on down in perpetuity. A small amount of money and a few possessions, such as a silver gilt bowl, were also willed to his younger daughter, Judith. And it appears that those items were originally intended to go to his son-in-law, Judith's husband. But at some point in the ensuing days, those lines were revised to say that they went to Judith directly. We don't know why he did this. But it is possible that it stems from the fact that Judith's husband, Shakespeare's son-in-law, had been accused of fathering an illegitimate child with another woman who then died in childbirth. Also, small bequests of money and small gifts were designated for friends and business partners, including several from the theater world of London, such as the actors John Hemming, Henry Condal, and Richard Burbage. To his wife, Anne Hathaway Shakespeare, William left only, quote, my second best bed. And even that line evidently was scribbled as an interlinear note added in sometime later, possibly just before William's death. Reportedly, William Shakespeare finally died on April 23rd, 1616 which happened to be, according to later stories, his 52nd birthday. It's not uncommon for people to hold out and cling to life until they reach some sort of milestone day. You may have heard of the story that both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on July 4th, 1826, the exact 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So this is not an entirely unusual occurrence. Did it matter that it was his 52nd birthday? Well, as I may get to later when I talk about the sonnets, the number 52 seems to have had a special significance for Shakespeare in which he connected it to the cycle of time, 52 being the number of weeks in the year. Shortly after William Shakespeare was buried in the chancel of Holy Trinity Church, the main parish church in Stratford, where he had been serving as a lay rector, and he was laid to rest nearby family members. Thus far, Shakespeare's death and the last remaining documents relating to his last days are unremarkable. His passing evidently was fairly obscure and undramatic, and he left behind fairly few clues as to who he was, or how he had lived his life. If we look at the will itself, there is no mention at all of plays, poetry, writings, or anything of the sort, no suggestion that he had been famous or successful, apart from his personal relationship with the actors that I mentioned before. And yet, his legacy of his writings gave rise to the greatest fame there has ever been surrounding any author, and it prompted a centuries-long quest, a sort of passionate hunt to uncover the real man, who he was, what he thought, what he believed, how he lived. Indeed, it's been called the greatest battery of research ever aimed upon a single person in the history of scholarship. And what it has turned up is rather scarce. William Shakespeare continues to elude us in many ways. And as I said, no other personal documents relating to the man himself have ever been found apart from that will and testament. And this lack of concrete information, this vacuum, has been filled to a great degree by myth. Either myths built up around William Shakespeare himself or, as the case may be, around other individuals who either were connected to Shakespeare or who some people have alleged are the real Shakespeare in the sense of someone who actually wrote the plays and poems that were allegedly falsely attributed to William Shakespeare. But for several years, it seems, Shakespeare was simply 
a moderately successful, moderately admired dead writer. And the clues as to his growing fame and notoriety began to appear a few years later. Most importantly, in 1621, a memorial to Shakespeare was installed in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. And this memorial is a carved monument with a portrait bust of the poet, above him a stone entablature, and below him a plaque, a large plaque with an inscription. And the English portion of the inscription reads, quote, Stay, passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath plast within this monument, Shakespeare, with whom quick nature died, whose name doth deck this tomb far more than cost, since all that he hath writ leaves living art but page to serve his wit. Now, you may already have the sense that this inscription, in large part, is basically indecipherable. It's hard to follow or even parse out what the later lines are saying. It seems to refer in some way to Shakespeare being a writer and one who possessed great wit. But beyond that, it's very confusing. Most biographers tend to simply ignore or gloss over this inscription and its strange, cryptic wording. But one, Stanley Wells, a 20th century biographer, does discuss it and calls it, quote, somewhat cryptic and goes on to say, quote, the only sense I can make out of the last bit is that his compositions relegate the sculptor's art to the rank of mere page, knight's servant in training, or just a low-level servant to a nobleman. And Wells goes on, uh, the it relegates the sculptor's art to the rank of a mere page, with perhaps a forced pun on the writer's pages, offering service to his genius. Or perhaps that all art subsequent to Shakespeare's is a page or servant to his. Really, it's anyone's guess. If I were to speculate, I would say perhaps when the inscription refers to living art, it may mean theatrical performances and uh, actors' art, which merely serve as vehicles or conveyances for the wit of Shakespeare's writing. But really, as I said, anyone's guess is as good as anyone else's. Stanley Wells also notes the irony that, quote, his name does not deck the tomb, and it's not a tomb anyway. So if you look at this memorial, there's no tomb in it. It's possible that the plaque below the sculpture bust is actually a space that was intended for a tomb or a sarcophagus of some kind that was never created and never installed because, as I said before, Shakespeare actually was buried in the chancel of the church. We do not know for certain precisely where William Shakespeare's remains were laid to rest, but... Traditionally, his burial place is supposed to be a particular spot in the chancel floor, which also has beside it a plaque with a short inscription in doggerel verse. And that inscription reads, quote, Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Now, generally, biographers doubt that that little bit of doggerel was actually written by Shakespeare because it's rather hackneyed and not a great composition. <laughs> it's unremarkable, apart from the fact that it's next to Shakespeare's reputed burial spot. However, it is also asserted that this inscription, which says, Cursed be he that moves my bones, is part of why Shakespeare has never been disinterred and moved into the poet's corner of Westminster Abbey, which is where all the other great literary leading lights of Britain have been placed over the years. So, in a sense, the memorial and the inscriptions placed in Holy Trinity Church were both the very end, right, the kind of concluding note 
on Shakespeare's life and career. But at the same time, they were also the beginning. They were the beginning of Shakespeare's immortality, of his rise to stardom and iconic status. They were the first attempts to create not only a memorialized but a mythic Shakespeare. The next stage that we know of in this process of myth-making comes with the first folio, which was published in 1623. So this was a book which is called a folio because it was made of large leaf pages rather than small folded over and cut pages like you'd see in a quarto. This first folio collected all the plays, apparently, that its editors and compilers could get their hands on. We know that many of them had been published before. There were 36 in total, and it seems 22, we know, in the the record had been previously published in small quarto form. But 14 of them had never before been published that we know of and may have been coming to print for the first time ever. The plays themselves apparently were collected and edited by Henry Condell and John Hemming, these two moderately successful stage actors who evidently were friends of Shakespeare because they were mentioned in his will. However, the larger project of editing, typesetting, designing, investing in and promoting this first folio was spearheaded not by Condell or Hemming, but by Ben Jonson, who at this moment in the 1620s was probably the most famous, successful, popular writer in England. And like Shakespeare, he was a writer of poetry and verse plays, and he was much more of an ambitious self-promoter. He actually self-published a collection of his own plays, which he referred to as, quote, works. And he was actually criticized at the time for calling his own plays works, because that was a term of dignity for real literature, and plays were seen as just light entertainment. So he was, you could say, the first theatrical booster who tried to both popularize and dignify the art of playwriting in England. And he began by doing that for himself, and then he did so as well for Shakespeare. So if we open the first folio, we see a short introductory preface, which dedicates the book to two prominent noblemen, William the Earl of Pembroke, who was Lord Chamberlain at the time, and Philip the Earl of Montgomery, who was a gentleman of His Majesty's bedchamber. So right away, this book is searching for prestige and status by connections to prominent noblemen and to the royal court. We also see a strange and fairly poor quality portrait, a woodcut portrait of Shakespeare, which has been reproduced many times. You can see it all over the place, but which is really much more kind of clunky, boxy, and crude than most other author portraits that you would see in the frontispieces of books at that time. The dedicatory preface, which supposedly is by Condell and Hemming, and the other introductory material to the book speak about Shakespeare, but they speak very vaguely and obliquely and really give almost no information and no clear details about Shakespeare, about who he was or how he lived or how he wrote. It included a long eulogy poem by Ben Jonson, which contains really effusive praise of Shakespeare. And Jonson begins in a customarily polite and poetic way by declaring himself inferior to Shakespeare and inadequate even to sing the praises of this greater writer who was Shakespeare. And in the middle of the poem, he sort of bursts into raptures and says, quote, Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. My Shakespeare, rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer, or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still, while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. 
So these beautiful phrases by Ben Jonson have kind of been attached to Shakespeare and repeated a million times ever since. The wonder of our stage, right? And the notion that uh, that Shakespeare towers above even the great English writers like Chaucer and Spencer. The encapsulation of the Elizabethan spirit, right? The soul of the age. But at the same time, he is for all time. He is immortal, right? And Johnson goes on to declare Shakespeare as equal to or better than the classics, even Sophocles, even though, quote, he says, though thou hadst small Latin and less Greek, right? Although you are only an English writer, you are not a master of the classics, but you are, you are an equal to the great writers of antiquity. And finally, he puts forward Shakespeare as a new classic, a pride of Britain in the same way that those ancient writers were the great monuments of Greece and Rome. And he says, quote, Triumph, my Britain, thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. He was not of an age, but for all time. Right. And part of why... Ben Jonson's eulogistic poem here in the first folio, I think, has become such a classic is because later readers agree with him. <laughs> right? he, he happens to be correct, right? And today, most of the reading public and most critics hold Shakespeare as even more brilliant and important in the history of literature than Sophocles or Chaucer, right? They're, Shakespeare is the one whose name has become an adjective, right? Shakespearean captures both the style of the time, right? The particularity of Elizabethan and Jacobian England and its, its taste and its wit, while also embodying this kind of immortal spirit, this, this timeless brilliance and genius, this mastery of human nature and mastery of the English language, right? So he is, in a sense, the great weapon of promotion and pride in the English language and the English people. Now, nonetheless, we have to note that Ben Jonson was the main manager and investor in the first folio. And he was an inveterate promoter and salesman. He was publishing this book for profit. And so we can't just take at face value whether he was entirely sincere in this praise or if it was marketing. It may seem entirely true to us that his judgments were correct and that he rightly recognized the towering importance of Shakespeare. But if we look at Ben Jonson's other writings, it actually suggests differently that, in fact, he didn't really sincerely believe these things about Shakespeare, not entirely. Now, be that as it may, we also have to consider, as a separate point, that Jonson does not include any particular personal details about William Shakespeare, nothing about his appearance, his personality or character, his behavior, his life story, nothing. Except there are two small phrases in two passages in the poem that clearly connect this author to the man whose will and testament was written up in Stratford in 1616. And one of them is he refers in one line to thy Stratford monument. So he probably is alluding here to the monument that had been installed in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford and is acknowledging that Shakespeare was from Stratford, right? And this is the specific William Shakespeare that we're talking about. And then later in the poem, when he is discussing uh, Shakespeare's genius, he says, quote, Sweet swan of Avon, what a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear, and make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our James. So this tells us, for one thing, that the specific Stratford that Ben Jonson is talking about is Stratford upon Avon. It's not any other Stratford around England. So it further confirms the origins of this particular man. And then it specifically explains 
that William Shakespeare left Stratford and came to London, right, the banks of the Thames, and made those flights probably means produced plays, right, in London. And finally, he says that so did take Eliza and our James, meaning that impressed Queen Elizabeth I and King James I, both of whom we know were patrons of theater and specifically patronized Shakespeare's acting troupe. So this gives us basically all the information that Ben Jonson actually conveys about Shakespeare. If there was more that Jonson knew, either for some reason he left it out, or he just didn't consider it significant or interesting enough, maybe the details of his life, his family, where he lived, whom he knew, how he wrote, was kind of common knowledge in the circles that wanted to know those sorts of things. And so they just don't appear anywhere in the first folio. So this eulogy by Ben Jonson, although it says so little specific about Shakespeare, it is probably the only surviving first-hand description of Shakespeare penned by someone who knew him in life. And as I'll talk about later, there are other descriptions about Shakespeare, his personality, his appearance. But it's very uncertain whether any of those people really knew him or whether they're necessarily talking about Shakespeare specifically, right? This is the only discussion of Shakespeare, who he was or his life, that was definitely penned by someone who was explicitly talking about him specifically and who most likely knew him, right? That's, that's it. Nine years later, in 1632, the plays were reissued in a second folio. And this second folio included short poems with more praise by Ben Jonson and also by John Milton. Okay, so it, by this time, it seems his literary reputation was growing to some degree and new, younger poets were interested in Shakespeare's work. So from this point onward, Shakespeare had something of an up and down in terms of his reputation and his popularity, but eventually he would take off and become the great literary hero of England and a great celebrated author for the entire world. But again, if we look back at Johnson's other writings, including his private writings, His view of Shakespeare was very mixed. You could say it was ambivalent or even mainly negative. In Johnson's journals, he briefly mentions Shakespeare a couple of times and criticizes him as a hasty and sloppy writer. Johnson considered himself and other playwrights whom he admired to be more meticulous and more perfectionist in how they polished their verse and constructed their plays. And he sees Shakespeare as brilliant and talented, but also hasty and sloppy. And indeed, there are clues and hints that Johnson in many ways really looked down on Shakespeare and didn't particularly like or admire him as a person, even if he appreciated Shakespeare's writings and the popularity and appeal of his writings. He didn't necessarily like him much as a person. And in fact, if we look back at that eulogy, he refers, as I said, to Shakespeare's Stratford Monument. And I pronounce it that way, not monument, but monument, because he spells it M-O-N-I-M-E-N-T, which at that time in the 1600s was already an outdated, archaic spelling of the word monument. And it also had a second meaning. Monument with an I could also mean a person whose behavior and actions provoke ridicule. And it's pretty clear that Ben Jonson intentionally meant to include that double meaning, that hint, because in the original edition of the first folio, that letter I in the word is in bold. (laughs) So if we put the available evidence together, it seems that Johnson really had a lot of misgivings about Shakespeare, 
probably was not really a good friend and not really a great admirer, but he saw fit to praise his work very effusively in a way that later generations have kind of signed on to. So already right in the first folio and this writing by Ben Jonson, we see hints and clues that at least some people didn't view Shakespeare himself in the most positive light, and that if we look beyond the myth, we get a more mixed and peculiar picture of who Shakespeare really was. But nonetheless, the power of his writings ensured that his iconic status would only continue to grow. And there are also particular contingent political and historical reasons why Shakespeare ended up becoming such a great literary hero and icon, even if in his own lifetime he was only a moderately successful, reasonably popular writer that not everybody loved. So if we look through the 1600s onward after the publication of the first folio, the plays continued to be performed somewhat frequently. He was not necessarily considered the greatest writer of his time, not yet, but his plays were popular and they could be staged and they could sell some tickets. And poets also appreciated his verse, both in the plays and in the other poems. And so interest in Shakespeare and who he was in his life, in his connections, did start to grow a bit. And in the 1640s and 50s, some literary aficionados and antiquarians started to travel to Stratford in order to try to gather information or oral accounts about Shakespeare, right, and about his life there. And these included the antiquarian John Aubrey, who later became very influential. So these fans, you could say, little by little gathered anecdotes uh, and claims that may or may not be true, that are varying degrees of credibility or reliability about Shakespeare and his life. And the Shakespeare scholar James Shapiro, in his book Contested Will, summarizes a bit of the results of this sort of posthumous search for Shakespeare in the 1640s, 50s, and 60s. And he says, quote, By the time those in search of Shakespeare finally made the pilgrimage to Stratford in the mid-17th century, led by Thomas Betterton, John Aubrey, and Thomas Fuller, all that remained were second-hand anecdotes. We've learned from these that Shakespeare had apprenticed as a butcher, that he drank heavily, that he poached deer, that he didn't enjoy carousing and wasn't a company keeper that he died of a fever after a bout of drinking with Ben Jonson and Michael Drayton, that he died a Catholic. So many literary scholars over the years have drawn on these sort of collected anecdotes of Shakespeare, but as any historian will tell you, they have to be taken with a large grain of salt. Now, serious authors, scholars, publishers over the course of the 1600s tended not to pay much attention to Shakespeare or his legacy. People who were not particularly literary fans didn't see him as an important subject. And a great illustration of that is that in the 1650s, a book publisher did actually go to Stratford in order to meet with Susanna, the daughter of William Shakespeare. But he was not there to get papers or records about William Shakespeare, but rather to get the papers from her late husband, who had been a very accomplished physician, so that he could publish those. So what we might see today as this rare golden opportunity to learn about William Shakespeare's life was missed. Also, a few years later in the 1660s, a minister in Warwickshire made a note in his journals that he meant to go and interview Judith, the younger surviving daughter of Shakespeare, but she died before he had an opportunity to do so. And in fact, by the end of the 1600s, both of Shakespeare's daughters and all of their children had died. And so the Shakespeare, the William Shakespeare family line died out 
by the end of that century, and his remaining possessions and papers were mostly discarded or dispersed before any scholar was able to find them. Interestingly, at the same time that Judith died in the 1660s, it seems that there was a bit of a dip in the popularity of Shakespeare, arguably, although it's hard to say for certain. In the Restoration period, Shakespeare was clearly overtaken by Beaumont and Fletcher, the 17th century playwriting duo, who really became viewed as the great master playwrights of the English stage. Among the reasons why they were viewed this way is that they constructed their plays in a sort of more tight, methodical way upon the template of classical Greek drama with unity of time, unity of location, whereas Shakespeare was seen as more kind of uh, whimsical but sloppy, poor plot lines, characters coming and going, uh, and so on. So his reputation, it seems at this time, was was at least somewhat eclipsed by Beaumont and Fletcher. But that is not to say that he was entirely forgotten and that his work was not still performed. And the Restoration playwright John Dryden wrote that, quote, Their plays are now the most pleasant and frequent entertainments of the stage, two of theirs being acted through the year for one of Shakespeare's or Johnson's. Right, so Dryden is claiming here that, that Beaumont and Fletcher have e eclipsed both Shakespeare and Johnson. And it seems that in the Restoration period, literary critics of a sort, kind of amateur critics, considered his work to be formally inferior, but still reasonably popular. And as, as one professor of mine once summarized, you could encounter many people in the 1600s who would say, oh, well, Shakespeare is very good and he'll fill up a theater but it's not a Marlowe. Samuel Pepys, the diarist who is looked at as the great chronicler of the Restoration period, called Shakespeare's work, quote, insipid, ridiculous, and silly. So he was not a fan at all. And he wrote in his journals, quote, saw Midsummer Night's Dream, which I have never seen before, nor shall ever again, for it is the most insipid, ridiculous play that I ever saw in my life. There was, I confess, some good dancing and some handsome women, but that was all of my pleasure. And then the following year in 1663, he also wrote, quote, saw Twelfth Night acted well, though it be but a silly play and not relating at all to the name or day, <laughs> which is a point that probably many Shakespeare fans through the ages can relate to. Why is it even called Twelfth Night? The only Shakespeare play that he recorded liking was Macbeth which he called, quote, a most excellent play in all respects, especially divertisement. So he liked that it was an entertaining play, but probably we can guess that another reason why he was drawn to Macbeth more than Shakespeare's other plays is that it is so formally tight, right? The, the plot line works like clockwork. It's short. It's his shortest tragedy. So we can see how the tastes of the time really made it difficult for Shakespeare, right? Although he did persist as a well-liked writer. His poems, which include the collection of sonnets and the narrative poems Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece, these, it seems, were somewhat popular when they were first printed, at least Venus and Adonis certainly reached an audience and had some popularity in Shakespeare's own lifetime. But they were obscure through most of the 1600s, okay, after Shakespeare's death. Uh, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece were both printed in the 1590s and then not again for many decades. As for his sonnets, a few of them were printed in pirated and unreliable editions, such as The Passionate Pilgrim, which was printed in 1598. But the whole series of them were not published until 1609, most likely without William Shakespeare's knowledge or permission. And occasionally a few of them, again, were pirated and republished in other collections later. But a second edition of the sonnets was not issued until 1640, right, 31 years after the first edition. And it was with some bodlerizing. There were various changes, cuttings, rearrangements, pronouns changed in order to obscure genders and things like this. And all in all, his poems, 
particularly the sonnets, were not taken seriously and treated as literature worth studying until the 17 and 1800s, right? So it's been, you could say, an even longer dry spell in terms of Shakespeare's poems as compared to his plays. Okay, so as I said, Shakespeare's family line, his bloodline, had died out by 1700. But somewhat ironically, it was after that change of century that he began to really take off and that his reputation sort of exploded as the great master of English verse and drama. There are many reasons why this may have happened. The growth of London and the larger market for theaters performing popular entertaining plays, that was surely part of it. But also a rising nationalism, both in England and in Britain as a whole as Britain began to emerge as a major military and imperial power. And this spurred on a greater serious interest in English literature, in the English language. This is when scholars began publishing dictionaries with etymologies of English words and phrases. You can see how this was especially important for works like Shakespeare's comedies. You know, many people even still today might see a play like Twelfth Night or As You Like It and say, oh, well, it's just a sort of frivolous, light play, nothing remarkable, but it has beautiful, rich language. And it seems that this attitude towards Shakespeare really began in the 1700s. And as the century went on, there was a sort of quest to forge the British nation, you know, as Linda Colley puts it. The Acts of Union merged England and Scotland together into the United Kingdom in 1707. And there was a great desire, especially on the part of the English elites, to sort of unify the nation and build a sense of common heritage. And a great resource to do that was to draw on English literature, especially the literature that showed off the complexity and the richness of the English language. So as I said, the Acts of Union were in 1707, and just two years later in 1709, the editor Nicholas Rowe created the first critical edition of Shakespeare's writings, meaning a collection that strove to recover the correct, accurate original texts as Shakespeare had penned them, right, and that cut out these sort of changes, emendations, editing that had been done through the decades by actors and directors. Samuel Johnson, who became the sort of great sage of the English language and literature in the mid-1700s, really embraced and celebrated Shakespeare, again, as the sort of national bard, the national genius, and as a master both of language and of human psychology, right, the, that he, was, he had a greater insight for capturing and mimicking human nature than any other playwright. And Johnson called Shakespeare's works, quote, a map of life. So critical elite opinions were starting to shift around Shakespeare, and he also had a rising broad popularity. After 1737, at which point all plays began to be uh, recorded when they were produced, About one-fourth of all theatrical productions in England were of Shakespeare. There were Shakespearean stars, right? Thespians who were specifically known for playing Shakespeare roles, who started to compete and have a kind of Cold War rivalry between different theaters in Covent Garden and Drury Lane. And critics couldn't help but appreciate and celebrate this rising popularity of Shakespeare. And it was considered, you know, a great accomplishment that he made sophisticated literature that appealed to the masses as well, although critics tended to abhor the puns and the sexual allusions in Shakespeare, which are very abundant, and which they sort of looked down on as, you know, lowbrow or a vulgar. But nonetheless, at this point, the commitment to textual accuracy was so great that they were kept in the texts of the plays, where previously critics would have wanted those sort of unappealing aspects to be edited out. 
So the enthusiasm and passion for Shakespeare continued to rise in the 1750s and 60s among all different sorts of audiences. And this is the first age of what we've come to call bardolatry, right? There was now tourism to Stratford and specifically to New Place. People began to seek out the places of Shakespeare's birth and baptism and, and his life course and to want souvenirs. It became popular to take clippings off of trees that had been planted at New Place and were supposed to originate from William Shakespeare's time as a kind of token of this connection to Shakespeare. One of the great Shakespeare actors and stars, David Garrick, built a temple to Shakespeare at his home estate, and he also organized a jubilee celebration at Stratford in 1769. And so although it was called a jubilee, you can see it as kind of the first Shakespeare festival. And he delivered his own eulogy praising Shakespeare. And one line of this eulogy said, quote, "'Tis he, tis he, the god of our idolatry. And this is where Samuel Johnson, a little bit taken aback by this kind of religious fervor for Shakespeare, coined this term bardolatry. Nonetheless, there was a terrible lack of sources with information about Shakespeare. Nobody in all their searchings around London and Stratford was able to find a single manuscript by William Shakespeare very few records about his life were found, no correspondence, no letters. And this kind of frustration of not being able to piece together original sources about Shakespeare at the time when both love of Shakespeare and commitment to documentary history were intensifying, this is probably the main reason why eventually in the 1790s, a young Shakespeare enthusiast named William Henry Ireland came forward claiming to have manuscripts of several Shakespeare plays, including King Lear, and letters and prefaces and so on in manuscript from Shakespeare's hand. Among these writings that William Henry Ireland put forward was a previously unknown play called Vortigern, and passionate Shakespeare enthusiasts seized upon this manuscript, took it to London, and very quickly put on a production of the play, which immediately closed on opening night. It led to a near riot because the audience said it was junk, and no one believed it was really Shakespeare. And indeed, the first sort of Shakespeare expert, the first devotee of Shakespeare to really try to sift through documentary records and sort out the known facts about the author was Edmund Malone. And Malone very quickly realized that these were forgeries and meticulously debunked them in a long book. Nonetheless, even still after 1800, some people still kind of pathetically clung to the belief that these were real and genuine and that more Shakespeare manuscripts would be found. But it has never happened. Also, after 1800, a new audience began to view Shakespeare in a new way, not just as a great master of the English language and a great wit, but the Romantic poets like Coleridge and Keats saw Shakespeare as a kind of transcendent genius who was able to capture nature itself, kind of timeless human nature, human life as it really was, and reproduce it without artifice. They see him as a natural genius with no need for training, right? He was not a learned man. He was a kind of natural genius who sprung up from the people and even like from the soil of England. And Shakespeare became, over the course of the 19th century, a staple, both of the stage and of schooling. He begins to be read and studied seriously in schools and universities. And the staging of his plays begins to spread beyond Britain to the colonies. So by the end of the 1700s, you see traveling acting troops putting on scenes or whole plays of Shakespeare in the North American colonies, the Caribbean, and other places. And it could be used as a way of sort of creating and celebrating a common English heritage, right? Tying the colonies of the empire back to 
the mother country. And also, finally, they began to catch on abroad in non-English speaking countries, most of all in Germany and then also in Russia. And many German and Russian romantics similarly celebrated Shakespeare as a kind of natural genius and as a sort of romantic before the romantics, right? as, as their own progenitor in spirit. So Shakespeare's plays made their way into popular culture. Filmed productions began to come out uh, with the film industry in the 20th century, radio productions, and his language has been picked up into popular speech and popular culture, the same as in the literary world. However, there have been hardly any movies or television productions about Shakespeare, which is probably mainly because we know so little about the actual man. Really, the only successful feature film there's ever been about Shakespeare as a living person is, of course, Shakespeare in Love, the movie from 1998, in which Joseph Fiennes plays the young Shakespeare in the 1590s when he's in process of writing Romeo and Juliet. And although that movie is unique and unusual as a movie about Shakespeare the person, it, I think, illustrates a lot of the sort of mythic image of Shakespeare that has been built up, sort of preternaturally brilliant and inventive, romantic, passionate, mercurial, mischievous, right? Sort of like an embodiment of the plays themselves, or particularly as the kind of embodiment of the spirit of the comedies. We see him hanging out at Mermaid Tavern in London, which is a place that later anecdotes claimed he socialized with other writers. We see him carousing, getting drunk, cheating on his wife, having sex, sneaking into ladies' rooms late at night. And he's portrayed in this movie in contrast to other figures that people may know of from that era. Particularly, he's shown as being young and brash in contrast to Christopher Marlowe, who is seen as staid and mature and more respectable than Shakespeare, although in fact the opposite was true. Marlowe was an iconoclast, a rebel. He, his material was politically taboo, sexually taboo, and he died in a bar fight. And he was an exact contemporary of Shakespeare, meaning they were born in the same year, in 1564. They were the exact same age. Just Marlowe was killed in this fight when he was only 29, and Shakespeare went on to live longer and write more works. Who knows what would have happened if Marlowe had survived? Would he have become the superior playwright in all ways? We don't know. In addition, Shakespeare is portrayed in the movie as making up and improvising the storyline of Romeo and Juliet as he composes the play for the stage. This is also not true. He did not make up the plot line of Romeo and Juliet, nor of most of his plays. They were mostly mimicking or borrowing stories from folklore, from chronicles, historical chronicles. And the Romeo and Juliet story is a traditional story from Verona in, in Italy. Right? So the way he's portrayed in Shakespeare in Love really emphasizes the idea that, that he rose up from nothing Right? that he was a sort of scrappy young man from a nowhere modest background who rose up by talent, passion, drive, and originality, right? and that his works are sort of the pure products of his infinite genius and creativity rather than adaptations or reworkings or improvements of all kinds of material, classical, historical, folkloric, that were around him. And so I would say in, in this way, this picture of Shakespeare that we get in popular culture and in myth, it's an example of the myth of the lone genius, right, who rises to greatness on his own. And this myth is really a liberal humanist myth, right? It's a myth that's very good for Britain and British values, and then also even more so for America, quintessentially individualist world. We like to portray and imagine Shakespeare as this kind of, this man who comes up out of obscurity among the people 
from his own individual drive and genius. And this myth, this myth of the sort of self-made man, can be used to, to celebrate strivers, right, and to empower people who don't come from privileged backgrounds. It celebrates opportunity, individual creativity. But it also, of course, can be used to justify inequality and a kind of social Darwinism, right? The idea that if you're smart enough, you can kind of overcome your world and your environment. And if you don't, that means you're inadequate. You just weren't great enough to rise above the conditions of your life and your upbringing. And it de-emphasizes the power of accidents of birth and class and social connections, which tend to affect, of course, people's success and people's achievements. But more broadly, I think it hinges on this larger point of whether you see art as an individual creation or as social. The fact that today we so venerate the name of Shakespeare of this kind of towering genius, rather than celebrating, say, all plays from a given time period, like the Elizabethan age, we pluck out this one individual because of his particular distinguishing talents, which maybe were not held in such high regard at the time, but that are valuable in our eyes today. So as I said, there are political and historical reasons why Shakespeare specifically has risen to this incredible mythic level. But let's put that aside and say, okay, I have just made a lot of allegations and assertions about the sort of political undertone or framing of the Shakespeare myth. How does that story or that iconic image compare against what we can say from the documented historical record. So I'm going to discuss now what can be said about William Shakespeare the person based on the surviving direct evidence connected to the man himself. Well, that evidence is very scarce, as I've said over and over again. But it's rarely recognized just how scarce it is. Many biographies have been written about Shakespeare. Some of them are quite long and detailed. But this can be misleading because most of the material, if you look through these biographies, does not really come from specific records about Shakespeare himself or his life. They come from tenuous connections or observations about the social context. A huge example of that is the recent popular book called Will in the World, which discusses the sort of London theatrical and literary world that Shakespeare must have been interacting with when he wrote his works. But it's largely historical fiction. It's speculative. We really don't know who Shakespeare was interacting with or how, and how that bears on his plays or poems. Even a more sort of traditional uh, biography of Shakespeare, which is simply called Shakespeare, a compact documentary biography by Samuel Schoenbaum, has the same story. If you look in the book, you know, for one thing, it's not really very compact. It's over 300 pages, but a vast bulk of it is actually discussing social scenes, events only marginally connected with Shakespeare, if at all. The whole first chapter is just discussing the history and geography of Stratford, You know, if one were to write, say, a biography of Napoleon, would the whole first chapter be about the village in Corsica where he was born? And yet when it comes to Shakespeare, people have to fill out these massive sections discussing this sort of, you know, arcane details of the broad social world with very little actual reference to William Shakespeare himself. There's also a long disquisition on Shakespeare's father and his life and background and his religion and so on, with hardly a mention of William. And there are various points, if you look through this compact documentary biography, there are many points where Schoenbaum finds little details about Stratford or London and makes connections between them and passages in the plays. For instance, he discusses the charnel house, which is a sort of final resting place for old bones that used to be connected to the Holy Trinity Church at Stratford, 
And he tries to say, well, this must have may have been the inspiration for the charnel house in the final scene of Romeo and Juliet. Could be. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. There were charnel houses around England. Just about any English person in the 16th century would have had an idea of what a charnel house was. Does it have any connection to this particular item in Stratford? Possibly, possibly not. But basically, if you look at biographies and literary studies of Shakespeare, they tend to be really bloated with a lot of this kind of excess material, and it obscures the sort of through line of Shakespeare's actual life and actions that we can reconstruct from the surviving documents. So I'm going to do right now something that really any historian ought to do, which is just go back and list out what are the documents that tell us something about Shakespeare himself personally? And what do we learn from them? So this is very rarely done, right? Just laying out, delineating what are the direct original documents, putting away the anecdotes and the stories that were told decades later after his death and looking at the original records themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss three layers, right? Three types of documents that tell us something about Shakespeare. And I'm going to run through each of them. Firstly, documentary records that involve William Shakespeare himself from his lifetime, right? That he either had some part in composing or that someone who had a direct dealing or interaction with him recorded. Then secondly, documents that allude to Shakespeare in some way as a public figure, right? So contemporary accounts describing him as a performer or a writer by somebody who maybe had an interaction with him or, or maybe not, right? Allusions to Shakespeare from the time. And then thirdly, his writings, right? The plays and the poems, okay? And I'm not going to get deeply into the plays, at least not now. And the poems... I will leave until the next installment, and I'll examine the sonnets in particular for what they might reveal. But as for Category 1, documentary records, contemporary documentary records involving William Shakespeare himself, what is there? Well, firstly, he was baptized under the name Gulielmus Shakespeare, which is the Latin form of William at Holy Trinity Church in Stratford on April 26th, 1564. And at his baptism, it is recorded that his father was John Shakespeare. John Shakespeare was a yeoman, a somewhat well-to-do landowner, glover who worked in leather, and minor town official in Stratford. He left behind a hidden spiritual testament or booklet of commitments of faith in his house showing that he was a Catholic, okay? And there are other documents as well that have been found over the decades that indicate that John Shakespeare and also other members of the Shakespeare family were Catholic recusants, meaning that they maintained secret ties to the Catholic Church and refused to attend Protestant worship services. William Shakespeare's mother was from the more prominent and prosperous Arden family. So both his father and his mother were from the sort of well-to-do minor country gentry around Stratford. There are no records of William Shakespeare's upbringing or schooling. It is presumed that he may have gone to the Stratford Grammar School, which operated at this time and which provided a basic education in liberal arts and the classics. But the records of the grammar school from this period are lost, so we cannot confirm that for certain. There is no documentary reference that has ever been found to William Shakespeare for the years between 1564 and 1582. In November 1582, at which time Shakespeare was 18 years old, he obtained a marriage license for himself and a young lady from Stratford named Anne Waitley. However, the very next day, another marriage bond was issued for William Shakespeare and a different young woman named Anne Hathaway. We do not know for certain. There is no record saying why 
the first marriage license seems to have been discarded and replaced with another. However, six months later, after the marriage, Mrs. Shakespeare gave birth to a daughter who was christened Susanna. So this indicates that Anne Hathaway was already pregnant at the time of the wedding which in turn suggests that it was a kind of forced or so-called shotgun marriage where Shakespeare was obliged to marry a woman that he had impregnated. Three years later, the Shakespeare's had a pair of twins who were named Hamnet and Judith, a boy and a girl. The boy Hamnet died a few years later, but the daughter Judith lived to adulthood. Between 1585 and 1591, there are no records to William Shakespeare directly, but there are references to him. He is named in documents from a legal dispute in the family over his mother's property. In 1592, William Shakespeare loaned seven pounds to a man named John Clayton. Also in 1592, a pamphlet called A Groatsworth of Wit was published in London. And this pamphlet warned playwrights in London against doing business with a so-called upstart crow, who was probably an actor, and who was also called at the end of this passage, shake scene, right? shake hyphen scene. And scholars generally tend to agree that this passage in Groatsworth of Wit is referring to Shakespeare. In 1595, the royal palace paid 20 pounds to William Kemp, William Shakespeare, and Richard Burbage, servants to the Lord Chamberlain, for performances that they had made at court. So this is the first definite indication we have that William Shakespeare was working in London as an actor. In 1596, two applications were submitted to try to obtain a coat of arms for John Shakespeare, who is William's father. It seems that both of these applications were ignored or rejected. And they were full of many lies and exaggerations, including the claim that John Shakespeare had an ancestor who was a warrior who defended Henry VII. Also in 1596, a surety of peace, which what we would call today a restraining order, was issued against William Shakespeare to protect an unknown plaintiff. In 1597, William Shakespeare was cited for owing back taxes in Bishopsgate, a neighborhood in the northern part of London. Also in 1597, William Shakespeare purchased New Place, a large, elegant country house near Stratford. In 1598, in London, William Shakespeare was again cited for owing back taxes. In Stratford, William Shakespeare was cited for hoarding grain during a famine suggesting that he was in some way a grain merchant or dealer. Also in 1598, two men in Warwickshire proposed the idea of borrowing money from a Mr. Shakespeare. And William Shakespeare received a payment of 10 shillings for selling a load of stone. So it seems he's involved in business with various commodities and money lending. In 1599, an application was submitted to combine together the Shakespeare and Arden family coats of arms. So this implies, for one thing, that at some point a coat of arms had been granted to John Shakespeare, and that William Shakespeare himself specifically now wanted to create a new coat of arms for himself that combined Shakespeare and Arden from his two parents. Also in 1599, tax records show that he still owed back taxes, but that he had moved to a different neighborhood, to Bankside, on the south side of the River Thames. Also in 1599, he became one of the founding investors and co-owners of the Globe Theater, a new theater that had been opened south of the river, right near where Shakespeare was residing in Bankside. In 1600... Shakespeare was again cited as a tax delinquent. And also in 1600, he took legal action in court to try to recover the seven pounds that he had lent to John Clayton back in 1592. In 1601, two legal documents named Richard Burbage and William Shakespeare gentlemen as occupants of the Globe Theatre. 
So it seems that probably by this time, Shakespeare was using the family coat of arms, which gave him the right then to be referred to as a gentleman. In 1602 in Stratford, William Shakespeare bought a plot of 107 acres of land, as well as a cottage in the town of Stratford. Also in 1602, a higher-ranking heraldry official accused a subordinate of granting illegitimate coats of arms to undeserving individuals, including John Shakespeare. In 1603, upon the accession of James I to the throne, an acting troop called the Lord Chamberlain's Men received royal patronage and henceforth became known as the King's Men, and in this grant of patronage, William Shakespeare is listed as a member of the troupe. In 1604, William Shakespeare was again listed as among the players who had received red cloth for them to wear in the coronation procession for James. In the same year, William Shakespeare also rented a flat in Cripplegate in the northern part of London. And later in 1604, Shakespeare also sold malt to a man in Stratford, and then lent him a small amount of money. In 1605, William Shakespeare spent £440 to buy rights, a share in the tithes paid to Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. So he has a partial ownership of the grain and other goods tithed to Holy Trinity. And as such, he became automatically a lay rector of the church. Also in 1605, a London actor named Augustine Phillips died, and in his will, he left 30 shillings to William Shakespeare. In 1607, Shakespeare's daughter Susanna married the physician John Hall. In 1608, a Stratford church official died, and his will said that William Shakespeare still owed to him 20 pounds. In the same year, William Shakespeare sued another Stratford man for six pounds that he was owed, and that man then skipped town to avoid paying the debt. William Shakespeare and Richard Burbage were again named as tenants of the Globe Theatre. And finally, in 1608, a later legal, legal deposition said that William Shakespeare in this year became a partner in the Blackfriars Theatre as well. So he seems to have a business involvement now in both of these competing theaters. In 1610, William and John Combe transferred some property to William Shakespeare near Stratford. In 1611, William Shakespeare leased out a barn in Stratford. Also in that year, a list of Stratford residents who had made contributions to a fund to improve the roads around Stratford included Shakespeare's name written in the margin. In 1612, William Shakespeare testified in London in a domestic dispute case, and he signed his deposition in this case, and this is the earliest of the six surviving signatures of William Shakespeare. In 1613, Shakespeare invested money in a gatehouse in the Blackfriars area of London, and he signed this deed twice. So those are the second and third surviving signatures. Also in 1613, the Earl of Rutland made a payment to William Shakespeare to make a leather accoutrement called an impreso for him to use in a tournament. So this is the one indication we have that Shakespeare may have had some ability in leather working, okay, which was his father's main trade. In 1614, the town clerk of Stratford discussed enclosing pastures in the area around the town and named William Shakespeare as one landowner involved in the plan. In 1615, a legal bill of complaint was filed concerning a dispute over the ownership of the gatehouse in Blackfriars, and William Shakespeare was named as an owner of both the Globe and Blackfriars theaters in this suit. Also in 1615, a wealthy Stratford moneylender named John Combe died and left in his will five pounds for William Shakespeare. In 1616, Ben Jonson drew up cast lists of long past productions of his plays that had been put on in London, and in these cast lists, he twice mentions William Shakespeare as an actor who performed in two of his plays. 
And finally, as I described earlier, on March 25th, William Shakespeare drew up his will, which he later revised once or twice. His death was formally recorded on April 25th of that year. His will was read and proved on June 22nd, 1616, and his son-in-law, the physician, agreed to make a full inventory of his estate and possessions. That full inventory of his estate was most likely later brought to London to be lodged at the prerogative court, but the records of that court were destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666, so we do not know what was in that inventory. So this concludes the full paper trail left behind by William Shakespeare himself in the course of his life up until his will was proved. Additionally, more records can also be found about family members and close associates of Shakespeare that can be used to try to round out his biography. And many people have done this, have relied on these sort of connected people to try to give some greater sense of Shakespeare. Because as you can tell from this list that I just read out, the surviving records give us basically no sense of Shakespeare's internal life, of his beliefs, of his emotional life, of anything that could shed light on kind of the meaning that he put into his writings. And instead we get basically a picture of a very busy businessman who was shuttling frequently back and forth between Stratford and London, who lived in various places around London, and who was constantly involved in trading of commodities, of land and real estate, and finance, right? He was first and foremost, it seems, a moneylender. If you just go by the quantity of records left behind, he was a moneylender. But we also do know that he was a performer. He was continually involved in an acting troupe, and he was a theater investor and manager, right? That much is very clear. Now, as for what else we can say, what else we can fill out about people connected to him, there are some things like his siblings and the fates of his children, which may be relevant, although we don't have any record of Shakespeare ever commenting on them explicitly. One particular close connection that stands out that maybe was particularly important in Shakespeare's life was actually his youngest brother, who was named Edmund Shakespeare, who was born in 1580. So Edmund Shakespeare was the only family member of William Shakespeare who followed William to London and went into theater and, like William, became an actor. So he's mentioned in some records in connection with the theater, In 1600, when he was 20 years old, he reportedly fathered a child. It's unclear what his marital status was at this time. But he was involved in the life of this son, who then died in 1607 at age 7. And Edmund then also died only four months later, aged 27. After his death, he had an unusual funeral. It was held in Suffolk, in the southern part of London, south of the river, in the morning, rather than the afternoon or evening, which was more customary. He was buried in Suffolk Cathedral, and at the funeral, the great bell rang his knell. Now, it can be speculated how much this might shed light on Shakespeare and his life, because, for one thing, as I said, it was unusual for... uh, at the funeral to be held in the morning. It's possible that this was in order to allow other players and friends from the theater to attend, possibly including William Shakespeare himself. It also was an expensive funeral. Having the burial in the cathedral and ringing the great bell entailed a large fee. And William Shakespeare was by this time a fairly prosperous businessman. And it's open to speculation, whether perhaps it was William Shakespeare who paid the fees for this very dignified funeral for his younger brother. So many things like this can be speculated, but this may be the sort of closest connection you can find that maybe tells us something about Shakespeare, his relationships, and his emotional life. 
There is also the matter of his son who died, which, as I mentioned, was named Hamnet, right, and died a few years after he was born in the 1590s. And some critics have speculated or theorized that the short life and death of this son somehow inspired or influenced his great tragic masterpiece, Hamlet, right, which is about a son who is sort of paralyzed by doubt and unable to avenge the death of his father. So does this in some way refer back to Shakespeare himself being a father who has lost his son? Possible, but we don't know. Beyond those, beyond this relationship with his brother, with his children, and with his wife, it really becomes more and more tenuous. If we speak about Shakespeare's spouse, we can say that, well, it seems likely that he was pressured or forced into marrying her. There's no explicit reference to his relationship with her at any point in their life, other than their marriage and the christening of their children. And as I mentioned before, in his will, he only leaves her his second best bed. Now, from these facts, we can speculate again that maybe he didn't like his wife very much. Maybe it wasn't a close or happy marriage, but we really don't know. Okay, beyond this, especially, it becomes more and more tenuous to try to speculate about Shakespeare's life based on really thin reads of connection. So as I said, we can see from the paper trail that he clearly was a very active and fairly successful businessman. Can we infer anything about his personality? Is it possible that his, his actual documentary life has been largely overlooked and not discussed because it's not a very flattering picture? He may come across as kind of money-grubbing, right? Suing in court to recover debts from his neighbors in Stratford. You know, maybe... Although, in fairness to Shakespeare, that was not very unusual. It was a very litigious society, and it was a society where credit was constantly flowing back and forth in all directions. So he doesn't stand out so much historically in that way. But it's not the kind of romantic life we might want for the great poet, the soul of the age, right? So to get a more of an impression of who he might have been and how he lived, what sort of man he was... We can also look at the handful of contemporary references that have been found in published or private manuscript documents from the 15 and 1600s, where people who may or may not have had personal interactions with him made some comment about him. There are basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these from his lifetime. And I'm going to describe each one and just maybe comment a little bit on what it says. The first one I've already mentioned is from 1592, when the short sort of humorous pamphlet, A Groat's Worth of Wit, was published. This pamphlet was posthumously attributed to the playwright Robert Greene, but this is probably not true. It was some lesser, less talented writer who probably penned it. And part of this pamphlet is addressed to three unnamed young playwrights who are coming to prominence in England. And most likely, uh, scholars believe these playwrights were Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Nash, and George Peel. And the pamphlet warns these three young men against doing business with an arrogant trickster who is trying to rise above his, his social station. And this warning begins by telling the three young men to stay away from, quote, those puppets that spake from our mouths, those antics garnished in our colors. Possibly meaning actors who are performing our plays on stage, but in some kind of poor or dishonest way. And it goes on to say, quote, yes, trust them not, for there is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Johannes factotum, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. So, that's a pretty weird and cryptic passage, right? But 
roughly it seems that he's warning to stay away from some actor who likes to uh, improvise and who is an over-actor, over-dramatic, and who does not do justice to the written material that is given to him. It may have further meanings beneath that, but I'm going to leave that at least until later when I talk about the authorship controversy. Right. Okay, the next reference to Shakespeare is from 1598 when a young student named Francis Mears wrote a sort of commentary book on literature, and it included a chapter on English poets. So this short book by Francis Mears contains the first known reference to William Shakespeare as a writer. It specifically names 16 of his plays that Francis Mears particularly liked and appreciated. And he says, quote, as the soul of Euphorbus was thought to live in Pythagoras, so the sweet, witty soul of Ovid lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare. Witness his Venus and Adonis, his Lucrece, his sugared sonnets among his private friends. All right, so he's thinking of him first as a great poet, an eloquent poet, who is evocative of Ovid, who certainly was, it seems, Shakespeare's favorite writer. And he goes on, So Shakespeare among the English is the most excellent in both kinds for the stage. For comedy, witness his gentleman of Verona, his errors, his love's labor lost, his love's labor won, his midsummer's night dream, and his merchant of Venice. For tragedy, his Richard II, Richard III, Henry IV, King John, Titus Andronicus, and his Romeo and Juliet. So I say that the muses would speak with Shakespeare's fine filed phrase if they would speak English. So someone, it seems at least, was already by this time appreciating Shakespeare as a master of the poetic line, as a master of English. This passage also tells us a good bit about what plays had been written and performed already by 1598, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us anything further specifically about Shakespeare as a person, about who he was or where he was from or how he wrote. Right. But we can see this early sign of appreciation for him as a writer. It seems that his poems at this time, particularly Venus and Adonis, were pretty popular. And there are a number of mentions and allusions to Venus and Adonis in the sort of popular literature of the time. In 1599, the poet John Weaver published a poem called Ad Guglielmum Shakespeare, so again using this Latin form of the name William, and it praises Shakespeare's published poems, mainly Venus and Adonis, and it says, again, repeating the same phrase from Francis Mears's book, Weaver says, quote, honey-tongued Shakespeare, when I saw thine issue, I swore Apollo got them and none other, their rosy-tainted features clothed in tissue, some heaven-born goddess said to be their mother, and so on. Right? So again, it's uh, celebrating Shakespeare as a poet and a master of language. Also in 1599, Ben Jonson staged a play called Every Man Out of His Humor, and this comic play includes a character called Soliardo. And Soliardo is arrogant, pompous, he's constantly overdressed above his social station, and he's a narcissist and a social climber. And scenes in the play particularly mock Soliardo's quest for a coat of arms. And I'll read a few lines from those scenes of Every Man Out of His Humor. So Soliardo is discussing his uh, desire for a coat of arms and his submission of an application. And he says, quote, By this parchment, gentlemen, I have been so toiled among the heralds yonder, you will not believe. They do speak in the strangest language and give a man the hardest terms for his money that ever you knew. I can write myself gentlemen now. Here's my patent. It cost me thirty pound. By this breath, how like you the crest, sir? So right here, we're seeing Soliardo is a bit of a fool because 
he seems to not understand the language, the terminology of heraldry. He calls it the strangest language. And it's suggested that he's bribing officials to get his crest, right? It cost me 30 pound. So his interlocutor, Puntavolo, says, I understand it not well. What is it? And Soliardo says, Mary, sir, it is your boar without a head rampant. Puntarvolo says, a boar without a head, that's very rare. And his friends look over at his application and read out the motto, quote, not without mustard. Okay, so as Shakespeare scholars have observed, Shakespeare was at this time in the process of obtaining a coat of arms. The Latin motto that... Shakespeare and his father adopted for their crest was, quote, not without right, which seems to be then mimicked in the play, not without mustard. And also you might notice uh, the allusion to the figure on the crest, bore without a head, which maybe seems very possibly to be a reference to Shakespeare's Henry IV, which takes place largely at the Boar's Head Tavern. Right? So many have theorized, and it's pretty commonly accepted, that this character of Soliardo is in some way a reference to or a parody of William Shakespeare. Okay, And this is, again, another evidence of Johnson's sort of distaste and maybe disdain for Shakespeare as a kind of overblown, pompous person. Okay, two years later, in 1601, a series of plays called the Parnassus Plays were staged at Cambridge University. And in the third in this series of plays, there's a character called Gulio, who is a foolish romantic who loves to repeat and mimic and steal uh, the lines of great poets. And he's a particular lover of Shakespeare, especially of Venus and Adonis. On the one hand, you could say, well, maybe in some way Giulio himself is another parody of Shakespeare. Remember that Shakespeare, we can see in two documents, Shakespeare being referred to as Guglielmo or Guglielmus. So maybe Giulio also is a reference to Shakespeare, but he's a fan of Shakespeare. And later on, in a later scene of the play, the actors William Kemp and Richard Burbage who in real life were friends of Shakespeare, show up as characters and they talk about playwriting and what makes for a good and successful play. So Kemp at one point says, quote, Few of the university pen plays well. They smell too much of that writer Ovid and that writer Metamorphoses and talk too much of Proserpina and Jupiter. Right. So at this point, Kemp fictitiously, is saying, oh, you know, authors who are at university, who have all this Greek and Latin, they're too pretentious, their stuff doesn't play well, right? And this is probably Cambridge students making fun of themselves, right? And then Kemp goes on to say, why, here's our fellow Shakespeare, puts them all down, I and Ben Jonson too, Oh, that Ben Jonson is a pestilent fellow. He brought up Horace, giving the poets a pill. But our fellow Shakespeare hath given him a purge that made him betray his credit. (laughs) Okay, once again, weird, convoluted passage. Very hard to parse out what this guy is actually saying. But he begins, this, this character starts off by saying, well... Highly trained, university-educated poets. They're too pretentious. And then Shakespeare somehow is different. He puts them all down, meaning maybe he, he insults them, possibly. I and Ben Jonson, too. Now, this is really ambiguous because it's not clear right away. Is he saying Ben Jonson also puts down those pretentious, classicizing authors? Or Shakespeare puts down Ben Jonson, the same as he does... Ovid and all of those guys. It seems it's the latter, okay? Oh, that Ben Jonson is a pestilent fellow. He brought up Horace, right? He's too classical. He's too pretentious. Giving the poets a pill. I don't know what that's talking about. 
But our fellow Shakespeare hath given him a purge that made him betray his credit. It's been debated, what the heck is that saying? What is this purge? How, what does it mean Shakespeare gave Ben Jonson a purge? Is he somehow saying he, he did something that made Ben Jonson throw up? Is this maybe a little reference to drinking, binge drinking? Is it something about forcing Ben Jonson to say or admit something? Maybe uh, admit what his sources, his credits are? Don't know, right? Not enough facts to know. But that is one more reference we have to Shakespeare from his own time. The following year in 1602, a student at Middle Temple, one of the law academies in London, wrote in his journal a, an anecdote that he presumably heard at some point about theater actors. So this is the anecdote that this student, John Manningham, wrote down. Quote, Upon a time when Burbage played Richard III, there was a citizen grew so far in liking with him that before she went from the play, she appointed to him to come that night unto her by the name of Richard III. Shakespeare, overhearing their conclusion, went before, was entertained, and at his game, ere Burbage came. Then message being brought that Richard III was at the door, Shakespeare caused return to be made that William the Conqueror was before Richard III. And a little end note is added, Shakespeare's name was William. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a cute little story right a lady comes up to Burbage says I want you to come to my rooms and romance me in the person of Richard III which is weird considering the character as he's portrayed in the play but William Shakespeare gets there first and is at his game having sex with her and tells Burbage William the Conqueror came before Richard III, right? Citing the, the lineage of the English kings. There is so much in this little story that resonates with Shakespeare's plays. The obsession with kings and kingship, right? The obsession with the characters and personalities of kings. The punning, the double meanings, the tricks, the tricksterism, the mistaken identities and false identities. It sounds like a scene out of a Shakespeare play. Which, of course, only raises the question then of could it possibly be true? Um, Far-fetched, right? It's a little too perfect. More likely somebody made it up. Did maybe Shakespeare himself make it up? Is he bragging about his own wit, his own cleverness? Is he bragging about his own prowess? And started circulating this story to, to aggrandize himself and embarrass Richard Burbage? And somehow... This story made its way to this Middle Temple student who wrote it down? Could be. But there are certain themes that we should see arising here, right? Shakespeare's self-aggrandizement, his self-promotion, his egotism, you could say, his competitiveness with his peers and contemporaries, whether that be Ben Jonson as a writer or Richard Burbage as an actor or whoever, right? We're starting to get a little bit of a picture of his personality. After that, there's a pause where we don't hear about Shakespeare anywhere in written records until 1611, in which year a strange little verse appears in a book of sort of uh, epigrammatic poems called The Scourge of Folly. So the Scourge of Folly was written in 1611, so we're talking about nine years before the last reference to Shakespeare that I just discussed. And it was written by John Davies, who was a poet in Hereford, right? So outside London. So possibly by this time, his works and his reputation were starting to percolate out of London into other parts of England. And so John Davies wrote this collection, The Scourge of Folly, which contains a long series of sort of short epigrammatic observational poems on different poets and writers, including some English ones. And it includes this verse under the heading, To Our English Terence, Mr. William Shakespeare. And it says, quote, Some say good will, which I in sport do sing, Hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport, 
Thou hadst been a companion for a king, and been a king among the meaner sort. Some others rail, but rail as they think fit. Thou hast no railing, but a reigning wit. And honesty thou sowest, which they do reap, so to increase their stock, which they do keep. Okay, once more, what the heck is that saying? The later lines? Who knows? Totally unclear? Maybe is making some kind of wordplay or allusion or reference to something about honesty, possibly meaning virginity, uh, reaping and sowing. Maybe it's about farming, okay? He, he was a landowner. But as for the earlier lines, there may be something we can extract from them, right? So he's referred to as Will, and there's a lot of evidence, like in the sonnets, that William Shakespeare referred to himself as Will. And again, there's this reference to kings, and he says specifically, Hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport? Maybe that is alluding to Shakespeare playing the roles of kings on stage, right? Maybe he played Richard III or Henry V or whatever, or the, the ghost in Hamlet, and there were later stories and anecdotes about him supposedly playing the ghost in Hamlet, which is the ghost of a king of Denmark. But it's like a warning, okay? It's phrased as if something went wrong. And it says, Hadst thou not played some kingly parts in sport, thou hadst been a companion for a king. And a companion can mean a friend or a servant, right? An employee. And we do know that Shakespeare was one of the king's men, right? That his acting troupe that he was part of received royal patronage from James I. So maybe there's something being alluded to here about a missed opportunity that Shakespeare messed up and somehow failed to get into the good graces of the king or the royal court. And maybe it has something to do with the way that he played kings on stage. Okay, And that in itself is not shocking from the point of view of people who have studied the plays, that there are descriptions, portrayals of royalty in the plays that are not always so flattering, right? And maybe this caused some kind of conflict, political problem. Maybe also played some kingly parts in sport could also mean something about being overly pompous, acting like a king, right? Which would be in line with most of the other allusions that we've seen thus far, which tend to portray Shakespeare as somehow pompous, a social climber rising above his proper station in one way or another. But that is the last reference in writing or in print to William Shakespeare before he died in 1616. Everything else about him from the first folio onward is all posthumous. And all of it is, you could say, from a historical point of view, is of diminishing reliability. Okay, the last big body of evidence that I haven't talked about, of course, is Shakespeare's own writings, right? His plays, most of which were published in his lifetime, but some in the first folio after his death, and the poems, Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece, and the sonnets, all of which were published in his lifetime under his name, maybe with or without his permission in all cases, but published with his name on the frontispiece, right? This is a kind of minefield, right? Many historians and scholars would tell you, be careful, you can play fast and loose and come up with all kinds of weird connections to Shakespeare. And as those engaged in the authorship controversy often point out, there's so much material in there that you could connect them to anybody, Right? You could make an argument, make a case based on the plot lines, the incidents, the phrases, the images, that it was Thomas Edison or it was Genghis Khan. You know, you could come up with anything. So it's a real, it's really dangerous to try to get biographical information about the man himself out of his plays or poems. But as Al argued, the sonnets are different. The sonnets are unusual and that it makes most sense to see the sonnets as works that were written 
first and foremost for private audiences that Shakespeare knew personally. And so they do potentially tell us something important about Shakespeare, about who he was and the kind of person that he was. But I'm going to leave that to later. Rather, to sum up what we've seen, based on the evidence we have, the original evidence from the time, which is the most historically important material, it seems that Shakespeare was a man who lived for 52 years, traveling back and forth, managing affairs between Stratford and London, who had a circle of friends in the world of theater, who was a consummate performer, and who was seen by people around him as pompous, self-aggrandizing, ambitious, and clever, but unpolished. Right? So that's the picture we can have in mind then when we then look into the world of the sonnets and see what they tell us. So thank you very much. I hope you listen to the next installments. And if you want to hear all of them, again, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description and become a patron at any level. Thank you. Thank you.